Hi Beloveds, I am Chris Blackaby from As He Is Ministries and this is a new series which I call The Three Realms or Living From Heaven and it's going to encompass all of existence so it's quite a lot and it's going to be a lot of information uh, very quickly but it's designed to watch this information very quickly and then go back and think about it and expand it like the old zip files on the computers. You press it and it opens up to many, many more things. The reason I'm doing this is because I uh, grew up as a Christian and went into ministry and I, I burnt out and clearly I didn't understand some very important things about Jesus or the Bible <laughs> or God because they're all true and I'm burning out following him. And God took me on a journey where I learned many things about him. But what I mainly learned is the gospel, the new creation gospel. So in this first session, I want to purely talk about the new creation gospel and the great news of what's been done for us. Not good instruction, but good news. It has been done. The gift we have received. So first of all, I want to state that Romans states that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. The gospel is the power. Nothing else is the power. Ministry is not the power. The gospel is the power that makes ministry work. If you understand the gospel, that's the power of God for your salvation, your sozo, spirit, soul, body. Spirit saved, soul delivered, body healed with immortal life, eternal immortal life. It is an incredible thing that's been given to us. And let's go on this journey. Romans 6 says that don't you know that when you were baptized in the Christ, you were baptized into his death. And the same power that rose Christ from the dead also rose you from the dead. When you receive Christ, when you believe the word of the gospel, the miracle of Christianity is this. The mystical, miraculous situation is that God accounts you as being on the cross with Jesus, literally. So when Jesus was on the cross and he died, you on the cross and you died with him. He took all the sting of death. He went down into the grave. And then the same power that arose Jesus from the dead raises you from the dead. Let's read that in Romans 6. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him, baptized into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too may walk in the newness of life, a resurrection life, the same resurrection life. For we have been united with him in death, which we have, we were united with him in death, like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his, the likeness of his resurrection life. So you've died with Christ, and you're risen with Christ. And Ephesians 2 tells us, now you've been raised and seated in heavenly places. So you died with him, you rose with him, then in him, as he was raised seated in heavenly places, he's raised you and you are seated in heavenly places right now. 2 Corinthians 5 says, From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, like a human, we regard him that way no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed. Behold, the new has come. So when you died and you rose again, you became a new creation. What is this new creation? This new creation is a son of God. Oh, what manner the love of the Father has given unto us that he has called us sons of God, children of God. And children and sons we are indeed. We are now sons of God. And this is how we must understand ourselves. Jesus, who we are in the image of, was not a Christian. Jesus was a son of God, the beloved son of God, the uniquely begotten son of God. And we are made in his image, born again from above. We are now, we were of the earth earthly, and now we are of heaven, heavenly. And we are born from above, sons of God, like he is a son of God. If you see yourself uh, as an earthly being trying to get to heaven, even as a Christian, you will do things to attain what you already have. You are already raised and seated in heavenly places. And you are already righteous. We're going to look at that now.
So we are born again from above by the same seed that Jesus is born from. Everyone born from the same seed is a twin. We are like him. In fact, everything the Bible says of Jesus, it now says of us. He's lie of the world, you're lie of the world. He's a son, you're a son. He's a king, you're a king. He's a priest, you're a priest. The fullness of the Godhead dwells in him bodily. The fullness of the Godhead dwells in you bodily. We have everything that he is. He's given us his, his, his very self, the very person of Christ. But he was the first, so he has preeminence in everything. So you don't worry about it. He wants you to do his works and greater. He's very secure. He wants you to be everything he paid for. 1 John 4.17 says, As he is, so are we now on the earth. This is John, who saw Jesus as he is, fire in his eyes, sword in his mouth, voice up rushing waters, brass feet. He's saying, as Jesus is now, so are we. We've been given the very person of Christ. You didn't get saved from one belief system into another belief system, from atheism into Christianity. You change species. You're a son of God. You die with him. You're raised by the same power of Christ, the Holy Spirit. And now you are as him. Died with him, rose as him. What the Bible says of Christ, it says of you. Except he was first. So when you're a king and he's a king, he's the king of kings. When you're a priest and he's a priest, he's the high priest. And you're a son and he's a son, he's the firstborn son. Okay, so he's the first in everything, and now we are modeled and exist after him to become exactly like him. 1 Corinthians 1 30 to 31 says, And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let no one boast, let one who boasts, <laughs> boast in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 1 30 is telling us, that we receive the person of Christ. We didn't get saved. We received Jesus. And Jesus is our salvation. The person of Jesus inside you is your salvation. And it's saying it is our righteousness. So Adam was righteous. He had right standing before God in his innocence. And then he took from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And he lost his righteousness, his right standing before God. And the righteous, righteousness of Adam was lost. It's gone. Now, Jesus didn't come and give us Jesus uh, Adam's righteousness back. He didn't get Adam's righteousness and give it back to us. And we have to look after it very carefully, okay, by following laws and rules of certain denominations or scriptures or verses that pertain unto righteousness and keep yourself very careful, okay? And then you can lose it. You do the wrong thing, you can drop it depending on your denomination's rules, you do the wrong thing by that denomination and that church culture, you've dropped it and you're no longer righteous. That doesn't exist. Jesus did not give us Adam's righteousness back. We got Jesus Christ, and he is our righteousness. So the question is, how righteous is Jesus Christ? Well, he healed the sick, he raised the dead, he completed the whole law by the word, and he completed the whole law by heart, he defended women's rights. He resisted sin unto death. <laughs> he believed a word from God that he'd be raised from the dead. God's very happy to see Jesus. And that happiness that he was to see Jesus after he raised from the dead and ascended into heaven and walked into heaven and how happy he was to see that Jesus Christ, that's how happy he is to see you. Because that Jesus Christ is what is given to you, the raised Jesus Christ. So, th so this morning, before you got out of bed, before you even woke up, before you had one thought, good thought, bad thought, you've healed the sick, you've raised the dead, completed the whole law, defended women's rights, confronted the Pharisees, <laughs> were being unto death. God's very, very happy to see you. You have right standing, the same right standing as Christ. As boldly as Jesus can walk up to the Father and talk to him is as boldly as you can because it's the same righteousness. And he is our holiness. Christ is our holiness. So, how holy is Christ? Something to think about. Because that is your holiness. You're very welcome in heaven. You are holy, like Christ is holy. And you're righteous, as Christ is righteous. And he is your salvation. There's nothing more to do. 
In fact, so it says that the one who boasts, boasts in the Lord. It's not wages, it's a gift. No man can boast. You received a word. Someone said a word to you, the gospel. You believed it. And in believing that word, Christ came and lived inside of you. And in that moment, you died with him and you rose as him, as the risen Christ. And that's your standing. And all we're doing is having our minds transformed, being renewed by transforming our mind to believe what we already are. Sonship is the rest of becoming what you already are. Hebrews 4 says, He who has entered Christ's rest has ceased from his strivings and his works. Have you entered Christ's rest? <laughs> Have you received the word? Then you've ceased from your strivings and your works. So strive to enter that rest or you will end in disobedience. What disobedience could that possibly be? You will do something to attain to righteousness or you'll disqualify yourself by measuring yourself by some law, by some knowledge of good and evil. Both of those things are disobedience. Believing a word is obedience. Believing that God made you righteous once forever. That's how you start day one and day 1000 and day 10,000 and day 10 million. <laughs> Your righteousness is established by believing a word. And in that word, you receive the person of Jesus Christ. And he's your righteousness. He's your holiness. And he is your salvation. This is good news. It's not good instruction. And there is good instruction. Good instruction comes later. You see Paul and how he talks about uh, how, he, how he structures his letters. He will start by telling you the great news. You're raised and seated. Every spiritual blessing has been given to you. All your sins have been taken away. There's plans for you before the foundation of the world. You're going to reveal the multifaceted wisdom of God to all of creation. Seeing you've got this great gift, seeing you're a beloved son raised and seated in God's pleasure, this is how you should behave. Because we've never done it before. He told thieves to stop stealing stuff. <laughs> Look after your spouse. Uh, be good to your children. Don't get drunk. Uh, don't take each other to court because of who you are, the righteousness of Christ. Now, religion, or maybe even church culture says, if you do these things, keep meeting together, um, uh, stop stealing, <laughs> change your behavior. If you do these things, you become a beloved son whom God is pleased with. That's the wrong way. That's no gospel at all. You are the beloved son who God is pleased with. Seeing you are this thing, let this life come out of you. Be transformed by renewing of your mind. Sonship is the rest of becoming what you already are. A seed in a seed has everything it needs to grow is the fullness of the tree. You receive the seed of a son. And in that son, you can grow up into the fullness of being a son. Let's look at some scriptures about that. Ephesians 4 says that the fivefold ministry which is apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists, not in that order, but there, are there to build you into the fullness, the saints, into the fullness of the stature of Christ. And that means what it means. The fullness of the stature of Christ, to be exactly like him. Ephesians 4 goes on to say, put on the new man that's created to be like God. Wow, that's what Christianity is. That's what sonship is. You have the seed that can grow up to be the same as the risen Christ in your body. Put on the new man that's created to be like Christ. How? In holiness and righteousness. The same holiness, the same righteousness as Christ in the body. It's already in your spirit, man. But as your mind's transformed, you bring it to earth. Colossians 3. I might have it here. No, I don't. <laughs> Colossians 3 says, be renewed in the image of the, your creator. That's what's been happening. To, that's what's happening to you. It's happening to you now by the foolishness of preaching. You're just hearing a word. And as the words are scripture backed by the Holy Spirit, they are spirit and they are life and they change you. Faith comes by hearing the foolishness of preaching. Even now, your soul's lining up with what you already are. You've changed from when the beginning of this message to now, and you'll continue with the change. You're being renewed in the image of your Creator. We can see this all through the letters. 2 Peter 1.4 says, His divine power has granted us all things that pertain to life and godliness. 
His power has, past tense, given, past tense, granted, past tense, us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Godliness being like God. Through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory. Wow. And excellence by which he has granted us his precious and very great promises, so that through them, these promises, you may become partakers of the divine nature. Godliness, like God, partake in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in this world because of sinful desire. God wants you to partake in the divine nature. He wants you to do his works and greater. He wants you to be him on the earth. We are his body as if he was here. Everything the church mindset would like Jesus to do here on the earth for them. He's asking us to do as his mature sons, to grow up and take and govern and look after and take responsibility for his kingdom and his creation. His creation that he's given us governance over. The work of his hands he's given to man to govern. The highest heaven belongs to God, but earth is given to man. In the same way Adam and Eve will look after creation, we look after creation. Paul says in Galatians 4, My children, with whom I am again in labour until Christ is formed within you, or fully formed within you. Paul wants, it was expressing the desire of the Holy Spirit, that you'd walk in the fullness of the stature of Christ in your lifetime, to have Christ fully formed within you. Romans 4 says, Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will count no sin. <laughs> That's you. Blessed is a man whose sins will never be counted against him. That's you. You are in the righteousness of Christ. So let's uh, walk this out. Okay. I'm going to read it from Ephesians 2 here. And I'm going to walk it out. So join me. I'll say it first. We were separate from God. In our, in our uh, separation and darkness of mind and slavery to the flesh and sin. And then Jesus, the Word, came down, put us inside Him when you received Him, and took you up to be with the Father, raised and seated in heavenly places. Raised up here and then seated at rest in heavenly places. That's what happened. So Ephesians 2 says, As you were dead in your trespasses and sins, this is us here, the human state, in which you once walked following the courses of the world, following the print of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we have all lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So we are <laughs> children of wrath here, separate from God. Okay, dead in our trespasses and sin. But, verse 4, God in heaven, this is heaven, okay, over here, this is God in heaven. God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive, comes and gets us, stoops down, makes us great, alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Raised up, position, seated at rest. Nothing left to do. So that in the coming ages, he may show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So we are raised and seated up. He has done this. He came down, raised us up, seated with Christ, and gave us his righteousness. You have died and gone to heaven. Everything you hoped for <laughs> has been achieved. That level of Christianity that you were fighting for, if I just do whatever my denomination says, get my Bible reading right, or church attendance right, or this right, or that right, then I'll be qualified to be here. But He has qualified you to participate in the kingdom. He gave it to you. He gave you Christ. And Christ is your righteousness. 
Now, unfortunately, this is not how we think because we've misunderstood the gospel. So what happens is you don't know Jesus, you receive Jesus, and uh, mate, it's an amazing day, and you feel so good and close to God that you might even get up to here. Okay, and God's there, and you can reach out and touch heaven, and life's good. Okay, you receive the, the Holy Spirit <laughs> and salvation through believing a word. But then life comes in, and then law and performance comes in. And every denomination has a different set of law and performance. And you didn't read the Bible this time. And then you skip church. And then you watched a movie you probably shouldn't have watched. Okay, then you yelled at your mum. And now you're right back here. And then you didn't go to church and you didn't give a percentage of your income to God. And now you're back here. And now God's a long way. So why would God give anything to you? I know. Let's start going back to church. And let's start reading the Bible. And then I did it for a week, but then I forgot. And then I started again. And then I went to Easter camp and gave my life back to Jesus. And that was really good. And everyone was crying. And then I joined the outreach team. And now I'm doing outreach team. And now I'm in a home group. And I might become a youth pastor. Wow. And I'm so close to God. I can get things from God. If I just maintain this performance, I can get things from God. And then something goes wrong. And I have a disappointment. And I go back. And then I feel stupid. And I go back. Okay. This going up and down is the church life. Okay. It is Christianity. It's not sonship. Remember, Jesus wasn't a Christian. He was a son of God. So, so this is religion. This is the knowledge of good and evil. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We know right from wrong. And we start judging ourselves by right and wrong. To do this is to use the knowledge of good and evil, the very tree that got us kicked out of the garden, and we're using it to get ourselves back in the garden. The very tree that got us kicked out, we're trying to get back to God with. The very tree that Jesus was nailed to. We're presenting him our works, our dead works, in order to get back and be with him. <laughs> it's a terrible thing to do. <laughs> He doesn't like it. It's only the tree of life, which is the believer word. If by this works, you by your knowledge of good and evil think you're doing well, you will feel like you have access to God by your works. And that's pride, the pride of conceit. God, you're wrong. I'm better than what you think I am. I can get to you through works, through building a tower, through obeying a law, any law, any denominational law, any... Christian law, I'm getting to you. And if you don't do the law, you go into condemnation. The pride of conceit, the pride of condemnation. God, I didn't do it. I'm down here again. This doesn't even exist. <laughs> this life of all we're living is not Christianity. <laughs> it's not sonship. Jesus came down and stooped us up, scooped us up and made us great. And we're sitting here forever. With Christ forever, on his throne forever, the righteousness of Christ forever. We will never be anywhere in this place again, except in your own mind, if you make a law, a religion, and you judge yourself by that law. From here we are the righteousness of Christ, and as our mind changes, as renewed by our mind, new things <laughs> come out into the world. We look more and more like him from rest. So strive to enter that rest or you will enter disobedience. What disobedience? You won't believe and you'll do something. Okay? You'll do something because you don't know you're there. If you don't know you've got it, you'll do something to get it. And that is the first sin. Adam and Eve are in the garden. God's going to grow them up to look like him to govern his earth. And the devil comes and says, did God really say? <laughs> and they don't believe a word. And now they don't believe that they believe God's holding out on them. God's not good. There's something God has and he's not going to give it to them. And if, if you don't have it, you'll do something to get it. You'll reach with your own hands. So they reach with their own hand to take it by their own strength. They reach to, to the knowledge of good and evil. And instantly, shame entered. They were ashamed. They knew they weren't righteous because they had a, now a measure, a knowledge of good and evil, a law. And they were far from God. Every time you don't think you have it, you'll do something to get it. 
The Ephesians says, He has given us every, uh, he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. 1 Peter 1 says, He has given us everything we need, has for life and godliness, to partake in the divine nature, has given it to us. We already have it. But because we don't know that Christ has qualified us, that Christ has given us His uh, righteousness, His holiness, and His seat in heaven with Him, in Him forever, His identity as a son, we were rewarded for His works. We don't know we've got that. We will do something. And that do something is the principles of any particular denomination that positions you for a miracle, that positions you for God's pleasure, that positions you to be pleasing in His sight. But when you were born again, you became a son of God in whom He's well pleased. Jesus, before He started His ministry, was, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. As He became more, as He was uh, perfected through suffering and proved Himself through ministry, At the end, before he went to Jerusalem, God says, This is my son, in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. Meaning, he speaks for me. Now, all happens from here, in relationship. If you're trying to work yourself up to God, you won't be at rest to hear from him and become like him. Because it can only happen at rest. No flesh can inherit the kingdom. No effort. When the high priest went through the veil to go see God, he wasn't allowed to sweat. No effort is allowed to attain the glory. It can only be a gift, the gift of the person of Jesus Christ and his nature, his glory, his authority, his mind, the mind of God, the love of God, (laughs) the peace of God. It's all his, not faith in, faith of. You get the whole package of God. Here, we're doing works unto faith, works unto righteousness. But here we're doing works from righteousness, from rest. Here is works. Here is fruit, fruit of the Spirit, fruit that lasts, much fruit and fruit that lasts, if you abide in Him. This is not abiding in Him. This is obeying the law, which Jesus came to fulfill (laughs) and complete and give us that righteousness. This is unity, oneness, resting, abiding, dwelling, where all fruit comes from. You must be very careful, because religion sets a standard. And the standard religion sets for you is a standard that you can achieve on your best day. Religion is clever and cruel. Religion will never ask you to do more than what you can do, because then you'd give up. You might find grace. So religion for you, depending on your life circumstances and character, will set you a standard where you go to church and you tithe and you do a Bible college, a Bible study on Tuesday nights, and you live a certain way, okay? And this is your standard. And you're just maintaining it by your strength, okay? Your soul can do this. And then it might push it a little bit further. And now we're praying for revival uh, and for the Peace of Jerusalem, 6 o'clock every morning. All right, you add that, okay? And you hold that standard, hold that standard, and then you don't get up one morning, you don't do it, you feel a bit stupid, you don't go to prayer meeting, okay? And now you're here, when well, you know you could be here, and you know you could be there. So now you condemn yourself. I'm not living the life Christ made for me, wants me. Not true. Wrong page, wrong book. This doesn't even exist. This religion, we map ourselves with the help of Satan. Okay, from here, at rest, you can read your Bible. It's great. You can pray for the peace of Jerusalem. You can give 10%. You can give 90%. You can give what you want. It all belongs to God and all this stuff belongs to you. And you just, you just want his name to be known on the earth. It's a rest. It's a peace. Now, we must be careful with this to be absolutely vigilant in rooting out this thinking. Because it brings death. When you reach, when you don't know you're here, you will do something to get here, as defined by your particular denomination, or as defined by the day you got saved, whatever building you got saved into. <laughs> the building you got saved into frames up what you believe of Christ. I got saved in, in this building, which means I need to give money to the Pope, 
means I need to go to confession, and it means I don't eat fish on Fridays. And they're your rules. You're saved into another one, means we do outreach, we do warfare prayer, and we have healing services, and we go to four services on the weekend. <laughs> Depending on what building you got saved into, framed up a set of laws for you. And you have to uh, behave to those laws. You got saved the building down the road, it'd be a different set of laws that you're measuring yourself by. When you don't know you've got it, you will do something to get it. And that is you take from the knowledge, the tree of knowledge, good and evil, its fruit. The tree of knowledge, good and evil only has one fruit, the good and evil fruit. <laughs> the good fruit and the evil fruit is one fruit. They're not two different ones, they're one. So if you're doing something good for God, okay, by knowledge of good and evil, a law, and you, so you're buying from that tree of knowledge of good and evil, you're buying from its fruit, you're getting good and evil at the same time. And death is coming. It brings separation. Is the arm of flesh under a curse. Now, you might be able to do it. And then if you have some weak link in you, because the weakest link always breaks, and down you go. Uh, and for me, I was performing very well for God. I have a very strong soul, naturally. But I had a weak body and holding this, doing good for God, good for God, for good for God. And death is coming, death is coming, death is coming, death is coming. Then one disappointment, poof, my soul went and my body was already gone. <laughs> and down I went, oh. okay, by my religion, not understanding that I, that I was always there. But if I'm strong and I can hold it here, then the weakest link breaks. If my spouse, doesn't have the same soul as me or same convictions of me and the same capacity to maintain a certain level of performance, I'm going, well, well, being holy, giving my money, going to Bible study, going out the streets. And let's say my wife can't do that because of her broken childhood and uh, just emotional capacity or character or personality. Okay. She's trying to keep up with me. And death is coming. Death is coming. It's going to hit the weakest link first. And I'm stronger than her. And she gets hit. Boom, and down she goes. And she knows I can't be with this holy, holy man. And she might get involved in the lifestyle or make decisions that disqualify her to get her out of this death. So she's done something. Like she's broken some church morality or law. Okay. And she's gone. And I'm here working hard for God. And people go, what happened to Chris's spouse? He's such a great guy. Look at all the things he does for Jesus. And look what his wife did to him. Well, <laughs> my wife did do that to me. I did that to her by setting a standard that she can never maintain. And vice versa, wife did it to the husband. However, if we're both strong, my wife's strong and I'm strong. We met at Bible college and we're going to take the world. Okay, we both hold this level up here. We're going up here, up here. Well, the weak link is your children. And your children can't maintain this. And they know they can't maintain it. So bang, off they go. And the devil will sit here waiting for you. Because once you've broken one, he'll say, well, you dropped the vase. It's broken. You might as well just go crazy. And that's what happens to two great Christian parents. And if you obey the law, you look awesome. Because you're obeying the law. <laughs> you're doing everything right. But that's not sonship. It's not salvation. It's not Christianity. It's not what Jesus did. This is a religion of our own invention. This is the religion that Jesus came to set us free from. We're here. I'm here. And I have a spouse. I want them to be here too. And I have children. I want them to be here too. And from here, we learn and grow up and become like Christ. Here forever. In a million years. Still here. In Christ. One with Christ. Increasing glory forever and ever. It started now. Now, you may be in a place where you feel, I have done that. Uh, I have damaged my myself or my family or my children. It's okay. <laughs> we start again today. And in receiving the word that says you're raised and seated and you're here, <laughs> fruit will come. And that fruit will go back and affect the things which have happened in your life because God restores these things. That's his nature. But you can only become, not do. You be. You be a son of God. Even 
in your uh, great desire to do good things with Jesus, and that's good because he has good work prepared for us in advance, and we'll be judged unto reward what we've done in the body, but only what comes from here. And you might want to discipline yourself. And that's great. Discipline is fantastic. All those works people use to get here, they're all good works. But only from rest do they become eternal works. Otherwise, all these things pass in the fire. They don't come. You could build, build an orphanage to please God. I'm building an orphanage, building an orphanage. Okay. If it didn't come from love, didn't come from rest, it won't pass through the fire. So even here at rest, we may want to discipline ourselves. We say, I'm going to get up every morning at 6 a.m. and read the Bible. As a discipline from love. But we must be very careful because if we do that five months in a row <laughs> and then we just can't do it anymore, law seeps in. Our law thinking seeps in and we think, oh, I haven't done what I thought I was going to do <laughs> and I've just moved away from God. I was going to give 15% of my income. I haven't done that. So I moved away from God. The law we made up. That wasn't a law. There's no law that says, read the Bible at 6 o'clock every morning. We'll give 15% of your income. It's a law we put ourselves under. And then we broke our own law. We condemned ourselves by the own law that we made up. Even the law we made up to be disciplined to be with God. There's only the tree of life. There's only unity. When you add disciplines and you add behaviors, <laughs> always know that you're at rest here. And then if you don't read the Bible, <laughs> it's five o'clock in the morning to read through the whole Bible in a year, and you don't get there, it's okay. Christ is your righteousness. Christ read the Bible. It's all right. <laughs> okay. He did it for you. That righteousness is given to you. Reading the Bible every morning is a joy. It releases, it transforms your mind to know what you already are. It's very good if you know you're here. If you don't know you're here, reading the Bible will be a weight that drags you back. And then you can't look at it. And the Bible becomes this perfect book on the shelf that just sits there in its perfection, judging you. And that's what religion is. Let's look at Galatians. Okay. Now, believing the gospel, this is hard to get a grasp on. <laughs> from the Christian perspective, but believing the gospel as a word is more important than moral behavior. And immoral behavior gets disastrous things because what you sow, you will reap. But it's more important to believe that God made you righteous and then let your character change up and change over time than to get your character and your moral behavior to qualify you. Because that is no gospel at all. Let's read uh, Galatians. I'm starting 2.19 and go through to 3.7 here. For when I tried to keep the law, <laughs> this is exactly this. When I tried to keep the law, <laughs> it condemned me. <sighs> so I died to the law. I stopped trying to meet all its requirements, right? all this stuff, so I may live for God. Here it is. When I tried to keep the law, it condemned me. But whatever law, here's talking about the Jewish law, but for us it's our particular church cultural denomination or, or something we made up ourselves for God, okay? And it condemns you. So I died to that law. I stopped trying to meet all its requirements that I may live for God. Once you stop trying to meet the law and know that righteousness is given to you, that he has qualified you, then you can live for God. But this isn't living for God. Doing Bible studies unto righteousness, healing the sick, Going out on the streets, living a moral life under righteousness, isn't living for God. That's living for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is to have another father. Dying to this law and being here where all life is, who has the son has life, <laughs> this immortal life, this is living for God at rest. The one thing you do from here is worth 300 from there. Because they don't even exist. They, they don't pass through the fire. This is your life. My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting the Son of God. Not my own righteousness. That he did what he said he did. <laughs> who loved me and gave himself for me. 
I do not treat the grace of God as meaningless. For if keeping the law could make me right with God, then there was no need for Jesus to die. What other translations say, if righteousness could be achieved by keeping a law, any law, your law, denomination law, Jewish law, anything, then Christ died for nothing. In doing this, we're saying Christ died for nothing. It is ruthlessly offensive, and you must be virulent against it. And it's very cruel, because we think, I got saved, and I'm not in God, because he's so amazing, so I'm here. And then, if I tithe, I'm here. And then, if I read my Bible, I'm here. So we're saying, Jesus, Jesus, thanks for dying on the cross, very impressive, got me to here. And it's your death on the cross, plus my ability to maintain giving and maintain reading the Bible and maintain not doing immoral acts. The cross plus gets me to you. The cross was deficient. That's what we're saying. Ruthlessly offensive. If we could get this way by good acts, by obeying a knowledge of good and evil, Christ died for nothing. This is, this behavior I'm talking about, is the behavior of the Western Church. The Western Church, as we're about to see, is under the Galatian deception. And we will not be able to go forward to what's coming on the earth (laughs) under this deception. Chapter 3, verse 1. O foolish Galatians, who has cast an evil spell on you? For the meaning of Jesus Christ's death was made clear as clear as if you had seen the picture of the, his death on the cross. Paul saying, I said, I've been very clear with you. You're raised and seated. No laws. Let me ask you this one question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by obeying the law? For here, it's the law of Moses. But for us, it's obeying our denomination's laws. Of course not. You received the Spirit because you believed the message you heard about Christ. Why are you here? Why do you have the Holy Spirit? Because you believed a word. So no man can boast. You believed a word. God is word in creation. He sends his seed. He just wants to be believed. God's love language is to be believed. He's saying, will you receive the gift of my son? If you say yes, he's saying, then I have. I've given you my son. You have his standing forever. In relationship, it's your new DNA is righteousness. Your actions don't qualify you to be here. Your actions don't disqualify you to be here. Your attitude didn't qualify you to be here. Your attitude doesn't disqualify you to be here. There's no attitude that attracts God. There's only believing a word. No matter how I measure myself, no matter what I'm doing amongst all these good instructions, and there are good instructions, they're good. No matter how I measure myself, I believe a word that I'm here. Even if I'm failing these instructions terribly. Because only from knowing that you're here, will you change your life? Let me ask you this one question. Do you receive the Holy Spirit by obeying the law? Of course not. The law, the knowledge of good and evil. You receive the Spirit because you believe the message you heard about Christ. How foolish can you be? Hmm. After starting your new lives in the Spirit, got saved, okay? Wow, a free gift of salvation. Ta-da! After starting your gift in your life in the Spirit, why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort? You were here, received the Holy Spirit, received miracles, signs and wonders, because you believed. And then, over time, you go back to effort to try and maintain this, which is hugely offensive. After starting your new lives in the Spirit, why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort? Have you experienced so much for nothing? Surely it was not in vain, was it? I ask you again, does God give you the Holy Spirit and work miracles among you because you obey the law? Of course not. It's because you believe the message you heard about Jesus Christ. This is the only thing that qualifies you for the Holy Spirit. The only thing that qualifies you for miracles. The only thing that qualifies you for His pleasure is to believe Him. To believe the gospel, the power of God unto salvation, that you are born again by the same seed, and this seed will grow up in the fullness of the stature of Christ in your lifetime, so you can be like him. You'll never be greater than your teacher. It's enough that you become like him. Put on the new man that's created to 
be like God. He has given you his divine nature, everything you need for life and godliness. You've been blessed with every spiritual blessings in heavenly places. If you put yourself out by your own conscience, you lose all access to those things. The tragedy is you still have them, but by your own decision, you're saying that you're out. In the same way, Abraham believed God and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. Abraham's a model. He believed the word because he believed God. God said, you're righteous because we believe a word. God says, you're righteous. God says, you're now my son. The real children of Abraham then are those who put their faith in God. We look at Galatians 1. Paul is expressing his dismay at the situation. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. The gospel. <laughs> Raised seed in heavenly places. Righteous of Christ. This is what he planned before the foundation of the world. He made him who was no sin to be sin that we may be the righteousness of Christ. Who can accuse God's righteous? No one. Okay? You're here. No accusation. The enemy is silenced. There's no truth, knowledge, good and evil. There's only the righteousness of Christ because you believe. This is the gospel. But if you turn from this, you turn to another gospel. I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one. So this is no gospel at all. If righteousness can be achieved by doing this, then Christ died for nothing. But there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. He's saying any gospel different to this, that you are righteous forever for believing a word, then all righteousness and change comes from at rest of being here. He says, anyone says anything different to this, may they be accursed. As we have said before, so I say again, if anyone preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, this one, let them be accursed. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I'm still trying to please man by looking good, doing the things, I would not be a servant of Christ. This is the only gospel. Now the whole Western church pretty much is under the Galatian deception. Because we say, hey, come receive the free gift of Jesus, the free gift of salvation, not righteousness or holiness. <laughs> we just say salvation. So you come, you get the free gift, and you're saved. Right. Now that you're saved, these are the things you must do for God to be pleased with you. And each church will give you their list. <laughs> give money to the Pope, or attend prayer meeting, or wear these different clothes. Okay, and what was given as a gift, now we add the law to them, and he's saying, what you started as a gift, why have you now returned to a law? But this is Christian culture. This is church culture, which is no gospel at all. And Paul says, if anyone preaches this to you, may they be accursed. <laughs> it's very strong, very strong words. We need to change our behavior. We want to look like the risen Christ on the earth. That's what all Paul's letters are. Seeing that you're raised to see it in any places. From this place, this is how you should live. And he tells you, stop stealing. <laughs> uh, be good to your spouse. Uh, stop suing each other and getting drunk at communion. <laughs> because you were here. Strive to enter this rest, or you will end in disobedience. This is the incredible, amazing gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. When this gospel was preached, it caused people to become murderous. <laughs> it caused violent out uh, and fights in cities. And it changed whole nations and kingdoms for the better. It radically changed people. This gospel was so offensive that God gives you himself and all his attributes so you can grow up and be like him. You are the family that God had in his mind before the foundation of the world. 
The people that he wanted, the people he desired. This was his plan. Jesus was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. His plan is to be raised and seated at peace. He who has entered Christ's rest has ceased from his strivings and his works. The Israelites were not allowed to go into the rest because they didn't believe a word. They didn't believe him. So they couldn't enter the rest and they stayed in the desert and died that generation. That's the opportunity we have before us. We can believe that God is so good that he would do that for us. He's so good that he planned this before the foundation of the world. He's so good that he created a family and his family are there to reveal his multifaceted wisdom to all of creation with good works prepared in advance. Like Adam and Eve to restore creation. Romans 8 says that all of creation is yearning for the manifestation, manifestation of sons. If you are doing this, become like God, you can't manifest your true self to all creation. In fact, if you're doing this, you will get angry. So in this, we're talking about the prodigal son. <laughs> We all know the story of the prodigal son and the great example of why uh, the church has missed this so much is we call the story of the prodigal son the story of the prodigal son. We want to talk about the naughty son who went away. But it's a story of two sons told by a third son. It's a story of two sons. The farmer had two sons. And the older son is the son that most applies to us. So we all know the story. <laughs> a farmer's two sons. And the youngest son says, this is nonsense. Give me my inheritance. And he takes his inheritance and he goes and lives off in the world. He's with his father, with everything the father has, and he takes it and goes and lives in the world. And we as Christians love that story. <laughs> but what we don't tell the story of is this guy, who's also in the house, but by his own decision, is working for to be in the house. He's in the house. So one son being really naughty over here, and got one son trying to get up there. Both sons have the same problem. Both don't know they're in the house. So this son, you can acknowledge good and evil. Okay, eating that fruit. He thinks he's doing a great thing, but evil's coming. We can do evil but knowledge of good and evil. Death comes quickly. Do, 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 it comes really quickly. Poof. Okay, this doesn't work. I'm going to go back and be a servant in my father's house. So he goes back to be a servant like this. He makes a call. Maybe his father's that good. He goes back like this. And the father sees him, hitches it up, comes down and grabs him, gives him his jacket and sandals and, and ring and takes him into the house. And this guy, older brother, is like, what the, what the... And then he gets a party, like, and he's angry. Because he's using good by the knowledge of good and evil, which is the same as using evil. It's one fruit, and death is coming. Here it comes, here it comes, here it comes, here it comes. <gasps> what have you done for this son of yours? Not even, my, not even my brother anymore. I've worked hard for you, and you haven't even given me a goat. I've been working so hard. The father says, hey, everything you have, I have has always been yours. You could have it at any time. Both sons make a decision that their dad's not good. One by the knowledge of good and evil goes evil. One by the knowledge of good and evil goes good. And they both get the same result. The one who was evil, because the clock moves faster, got to the end quickly, and he went into heaven, and the father came down and grabbed him. Then the father goes out to the son in the field and says, come in, and he's angry. Because the knowledge of good and evil has made murder. Because that's the nature of its father, the devil. And he's angry. And we never know if he goes in or not. This is the state of the church. The story of the prodigal son is a story of two sons. We have a choice to go in with the father and say everything he has was always ours. Because he's a good father that never lies. In doing this, you undo Eden. This son doesn't believe 
doesn't believe he has it, so he's doing something to reach for it. Working hard for the kingdom, for the church, for the outreach. Both sons are in the house now. Or oh, oh, one, the naughty one is, does this guy come in? From here, you're with God, and you just join him in what the house is doing. And Paul says, by grace, I work harder than you all. So maybe you'll work more. But enjoyment is from the house. This is the gospel that you're here. Anything else is no gospel at all. And when teaches you this, to do works unto righteousness, Paul says, may they be accursed. Strong words. The new gospel, the new creation gospel, you are a son of God with his DNA, grumped in the fullness of the statue of Christ to rule his works and govern his works the same way Adam and Eve were supposed to govern his works. It's an amazing thing. It's greater than we could ask or imagine. And while we're yet sons, what we will become, we don't know. There's more coming, but only for those at rest who believes a word so no flesh could boast. Let's pray. Father, your gospel is amazing, offensively amazing. We want to grow up and be like you. We want to walk in the fullness of the statue of Christ in our lifetime, put on the new man that's created to be like God. We want to be your body on the earth. We want to reach maturity, which is love. We're at rest with you, raised up high and seated, nothing to do. From here, we join you in the work of the house and we learn to become like you. Amen. Amen. Thank you.